Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am very happy to. I, I, so, sorry, I'm very happy to. to uh, I'm. I am very happy. This, this was awful, but I'm very happy to uh, greet you during the first keynote of the YR 2000, uh, 2020 conference uh, to introduce Renu Pius, uh, who will be our first keynote. And let me briefly introduce Renu as a person who Rinu is and why she is talking to us. So first and for all, Rinu is a senior, uh, as, as a senior researcher from the, uni from the University of Edinburgh. So she has published a lot of research papers. Uh, you, can, you can check it on her profile of, 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 of Book Scholar. And she's very active in the field of COVID research also. So she's, she's doing us important service. But I also recommend you greatly to visit her webpage, rinu.me where she has, put, has her own blog with a lot of great tips and, uh, and information how to use efficiently R. Actually, I, I, I at least try to perceive myself as someone experienced in, 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 in the language, but Rinu is always shocking me with something, something that I didn't know. So I greatly recommend her, her website, but actually we have invited Rinu to this very conference because of her book, R for Health Data Science. And I must admit, the value of a good book in learning process is, uh, I think, really amazing. And what Reno did with her co collaborator, Ewan Harrison, they did not only base their book on their own experience in the analysis of health data, but also on, on their teaching experience where they were ex uh, teaching students how to use, uh, how to efficiently use R to analyze data in R. And I must admit, I deeply recommend you looking in this book. I'm sure that Irina will talk a bit more about it during her presentation, but just to give you a primer. Rinu is great because she favors a good plot, a good graphics. She, uh, she values them over uh, wonky statistics. So you have a benefit of something, you, of, 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 of learning from someone who is not only uh, uh, who has not only a training in analysis of data, but has also a lot of practical experience in data analysis. So, Rino, without much further ado, I'm very great. That, I'm, I'm very grateful that you are today with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michal, for that wonderful introduction. Let me get my slides up. Oh, come on now, Zoom, Zoom. How's that? Are we seeing slides? No. Yes, we do. You're seeing slides? Yes, yes, Reno, we do. We do, we see slides. Are you, oh. If everything is okay, everything is okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I, I have YouTube going on in a different window, so I know I can see my slides in three different places now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning from sunny Scotland. My name is Reno Hughes. Um, I'm a researcher at the Centre um, at the University of Edinburgh. I work at the Centre for Medical Informatics. I am a data scientist, but I work with um, a lot of medical researchers or clinicians, uh, doctors, surgeons, people like that. Um, and my, uh, really, my talk should be titled Why R for Health Data Science? Because I will be introducing you uh, some, of the, uh, some of the coolest things I love about R and some of the ways we use R or R enables us to run clinical trials. Yeah, and uh, I'll, also, I'll also tell you about clinicians who called, who knew. Um, uh, I'll, I'll also drop in some practical tips because uh, I am a very pragmatic person and I can't give a talk without some kind of Go, go home and use this piece of code. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these too much. I think I'm preaching to the choir here. We know that R has awesome visualizations. Uh, it can do kind of all of the, the statistics you can dream of, all the machine learning, deep learning, big data stuff that you can dream of. R is powerful and versatile. 
Uh, most people also know about the R package Shiny, that is a great extension to R, enables you, us to do websites and web apps. Uh, interactive web apps interface databases automatically on like live uh, kind of li live interfaces like that uh, using shiny apps there's a whole session on shiny apps later today um, and I love shiny apps and they en enable me to do a lot of the work uh, I do uh, but I think something that gets kind of missed out occasionally is the community because R is so amazing there um, there's so many people who use it and those people are actually pretty well organized into really helpful and useful groupings and not everyone especially if you're new to R you might not be aware of these communities um, if you use Twitter then the R stats uh, hashtag, it's not hashtag R, it's hashtag R stats, and it's just one of these things you need to know, uh, is, is a really fun and friendly place, and I find most of my um, kind of new tips and tricks about what's new in R from the R stats um, uh, hashtag. Uh, there's a community.rstudio.com site. It looks very similar to Stack Overflow, if you're familiar with that, with the, uh, with the kind of questions and people su um, uh, suggesting different answers. The reason I now prefer community.rstudio is that it's a lot more modern. Uh, Stack Overflow is a great resource, use it every day, but um, the top answers are often maybe eight to 10 years old because they've been viewed or upvoted for many more people. Whereas if you wanna know what's the simplest and coolest new function to do something you have to scroll all the way to the very bottom anyway community.rstudio.com solves a lot of those issues because it is fresh and new stuff and is a nice friendly place those of you who use uh, slack for kind of team communication it's kind of like almost like chat rooms really there are two great chat groups that anyone around the world can join um, if you're a woman or any other gender minority, you're very welcome to join the R Ladies. I'll be there. Uh, it has a help channel. You can post anything, ask, oh, I can't get this to work. Can anyone else have a look? Um, if R Ladies is not for you, then R for Data Science Learning Community, again, uh, freely open to anyone to join. Just go online, search R for Data Science Learning Community, and you will find a link to show um, to join. And finally, uh, in the topic of community, the book down package, uh, which is an R package for writing books. I wrote my book in book down. Uh, the book down package, I believe has uh, kind of really uh, um, opened up so many kind of uh, book writing to so many people who would have otherwise uh, not gone round to it to or had time to format these things. Uh, so there are now so many uh, book down books. Um, it's most uh, all of these on these because this like come broke down on. They're all freely available. They're also published with uh, mostly Chapman and Hall and O'Reilly seem to be the <laughs> book down's friends. Uh, so if you want a physical copy, you can go buy them. But also they're fully freely available online in the book down format. And it's really easy to go through. Uh, you can bookmark pages. You can uh, uh, copy paste code into R. You know, uh, if you've ever got your hands on a PDF and then try to copy paste from a PDF, doesn't work as well as it does from Bookdown. Um, uh, and Bookdown has also enabled people to uh, write a lot of kind of internal cookbooks. So just kind of take notes and code snippets of that people can use. And I'll show you one uh, later as well. So I feel like Bookdown has really strengthened and elevated the R community and uh, therefore increased its reach. Um, it's now possible for so many more people to learn R uh, than it was before. Um, so I mentioned uh, Shiny apps are um, a great extension, a great R package to make uh, web apps, interactive uh, um, kind of things uh, around data. And here's a very standard one. This one I made. Uh, many of you will recognize the kind of panel on the left. 
results on the right. It's simple, but it works. Everyone, if you land on this, you, you kind of know what's happening. You know the variables on the left, uh, results on the right. There's a link to this website where everyone can interact. So this is a data set. Uh, these are patients who had um, abdominal surgery. Uh, and there are some variables about them. What kind of surgery did they have? How old were they uh, in age groups? Uh, their sex and kind of, kind of other, other things about their uh, surgery, but also outcomes, how well they recovered. And uh, we, uh, this is a research project we do. We've collected all this data and obviously we've analyzed it, we've published it. Uh, however, if you read our paper, uh, you might think, oh, this is a good paper. Okay, thank you. Um, but, oh, but did they look at that variable? I really wanna know how the outcome is influenced by that variable. Uh, and then you can go to a, come to a shiny app and kind of do your own analysis really uh, to check whether that variable that you're interested in affects the outcome or how it can uh, um, maybe um, related to the other patient factors in the data set. So the great thing about shiny apps is uh, the, kind of the main thing I think they get used to is enable other people to access your results in a quick and easy way. Anyone can go on this link and have a look. Um, uh, you can also keep the data secure. Obviously, um, this is patient data. I cannot share this with everyone else. But what I can do is keep the data securely on my server, but let you uh, create new plots or aggregated tables based on my data using Shiny. And Shiny keeps these things separate. So, so Shiny, the user interface that you can see on this uh, screenshot, uh, will only show you the plot. It will only show you the summary numbers. You cannot pull unless I do something really wrong. Unless I do something really wrong, you cannot pull the data set out, out of that. You can't, don't, don't try it, but you can't. Um, uh, so it's good for security, it's good for data sharing. Um, and uh, like I said, this is a very basic layout. It works, I made, I made, tens if not hundreds of these so i don't have time to spend a lot of time on design i need to get something out the door that works and is useful so people can make, start making decisions or uh, look at patient data um, however there's the annual shiny contest there's been two already and the reason i want to mention this is that if you look at the uh, run winners and runners up of the shiny contest uh, you really see the range of shiny. So if you haven't seen the shiny contest kind of gallery or showcase yet, go for it. So for example, I've just pulled out this year's winner. So I don't know this person, but I'm <laughs> very impressed in or fan here. So if you look at that, this is a shiny app. Yeah, so this is what you can use shiny for. Um, um, and the code is available on GitHub if you have a want to have a look. Obviously, this is a relatively um, a very kind of uh, advanced uh, Shine user, but actually, you can um, you, you can create pretty amazing Shine apps with, uh, um, without too many years of experience and too many kind of thousands of lines of code. So just go go have a have a have a quick look. Um, so you can do really uh, um, kind of amazing things with Shiny. You're not limited to that two panel pair, uh, variables on the left, plot on the right kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think we all agree Shiny can be used for data explorers, plots, tables. It can be used in teaching to make a point, you like get your students to kind of answer some questions about, makes sense. But shining clinical trials, where, where, what is that? Where does that happen? Um, this is where, uh, this is the uh, Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. This is where I work, where, when I'm not streaming from home. Um, uh, this is uh, this is a big hospital, but also uh, some of the buildings you can see there are actually university buildings. So it's a teaching hospital. There's a, kind of a lot of researchers, including myself working at the hospital um, and one of the um um and one of the things uh, you could use shiny apps for 
um, uh, when you want to improve, uh, do research at the hospital, and you, and we only do research to improve patient care. We don't do research for the sake of it. That doesn't make sense. We don't have time for that. So. Uh, go, uh, this is the same, um, same uh, kind of shiny app I showed you a couple of slides ago. Uh, this is the number uh, uh, number of patients who developed the wound infection after having abdominal surgery. And this was a global project. And by high, we mean high income countries, uh, then kind of middle income countries and low income country based on human development index to see how um, surgical outcomes depend on the countries or possibly people's income levels. And you can see that even in high income countries, and most patients in the data set are from high income countries because that's, uh, that's where you can get research and that's where you can do data. But even in high income countries, 10% uh, of patients develop a wound infection after abdominal surgery. Obviously, this depends on the type of surgery. Uh, you can go on that app and interrogate what the percentages are for different types of surgeries or um, different kind of patient groups. But 10% of, you know, one in 10, it's, and it's, um, it's not completely unavoidable. I think sometimes things just happen. Sometimes, um, you know, you can't avoid um, Kind of infection completely, but you what you can do um, is try to diagnose it as early as possible because uh, you you want to find out when it's happening so you can help these patients. You can um, start treating them, and this is where we devised the shiny intervention uh, to help us with that. Uh, so we are running a randomized controlled trial. It's uh, um, described in the paper link below. Um, and uh, patients have surgery and they, uh, they get discharged home. Uh, uh, but before they go home, uh, a researcher approaches them saying, hi, we're running this study. Would you like to take part? And there's a whole long process of informed consent. And if they'd like to take part in that study, um, then they are invited to send us photographs of their wounds using their smartphone. So you go home, you have your wounds, you take your smartphone, snap a photo, and send it to me. <laughs> when you're taking part in the study, don't start sending photos of wounds on Twitter or something. Thank you. Um, and then we use a shiny app uh, or a clinician or a doctor has a look at the uh, photos to see if uh, uh, early wound, uh, wound infection could be detected. And then we use a shiny app uh, to message the patient back um, so this is good, obviously, because the doctor can choose, oh, this is this patient in this trial. Uh, this is the response I want to send them to. And it just sends them out to the patient. And it also updates the database, the study trial database. Uh, so instead of one person doing lots of different things in lots of different places, it's all brought together into a shiny app. And this is how we can run, uh, quickly run, uh, very efficiently, a small trial to see if actually getting photos, smartphone photos from patients into the hospital, if that will help us diagnose um, emerging wound infections faster and therefore treat them quicker and have better outcomes. Um, so the, um, the different um, kind of responses sent out to the patients are, no, your wound looks good or oh, your wound, you should probably show it to a doctor or the worst case scenario, come to the hospital now. Um, I absolutely must mention that this does not, this text message shiny app does not replace anything that's currently happening. The patients, they get, they would be sent home as usual. Um, they would, they would have their follow up in how many days and they're always encouraged to go see a doctor if anything doesn't feel right, if you're in too much pain, stuff like that. So this only adds, adds either extra reassurance or extra urgency to get, yeah, no, no, go see a doctor now, don't wait two more days and, and until it's even worse. So this shiny app text messaging is an extra added on, it doesn't replace any of the existing kind of advice or pathways already. And the shiny app is exactly, um, almost exactly 300 lines of R code. So it's quite short. So you can, um, so you can really use shiny to build fast prototypes. 
um, um, and do small kind of almost pilot trials without uh, hiring a big IT company uh, to, uh, to write a new app for you, uh, then, then figure out how to connect to the database. You know, obviously R can connect to databases. Um, um, and and stuff like that. So uh, if, uh, if this trial is successful, then I'm, we're not saying that this should necessarily be worked in a shiny app because it does. Um, uh, you know, you might want to develop something that integrates the whole uh, kind of electronic system of the hospital rather than this one researchy kind of app. But it is a great way to prototype or test trial pilot things, and it doesn't take that much kind of uh, develop the time to do one. The shine is really great for that. Shiny can also help uh, deliver global studies. Uh, so this is the, um, the, the bar plot I've showed you twice now already. <laughs> I, I quite like bar plots. Um, that, that's from a global study. Uh, there are 80 countries around the world, 400 hospitals and 3000 surgeons are entering their anonymized patient data into our database so we can uh, analyze it together and make kind of conclusions uh, 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 together. Um, in the, the study is actually run by a very small group of um, people. Uh, the study, uh, um, the protocol is developed by tens of people. Uh, there are a lot of surgeons and researchers to uh, to write the protocol and to feedback into, and it gets you know uh, pushed around in all kinds of mailing lists and mailing groups and CC reply or why not? All of that happens, and it's amazing. But once the study was running, day to day basis, there were three people running it. So three people were managing eighty countries, four hundred hospitals, and three thousand surgeons. Yeah, so we needed a couple of shiny apps to help us do that, didn't we? Uh, again, a shiny app doesn't replace a proper database software. We also have proper database software, but we built loads of shiny apps, as well as dashboards and apps and, and more apps and dashboards and more apps that kind of latch on to the database and help us manage some of the, uh, the, the global flow of those 80 countries, uh, kind of 3,000 surgeons, so we can uh, we can tell them why they have an account or do they have an account? Is the data they event is good enough? What kind of variables need fixing? Then we can push data uh, kind of info back into the database, so we can mark uh, someone has completed their kind of data entry. Um, and because this is again, this is a research study, and this is a unique data set. No one else has a cancer data set from 80 countries. There are patients who had surgery, and their own surgeons entered kind of information about them. What happened in it? Again, it's completely anonymized, and everyone's applied for so many approvals for it. It's not some kind of rogues steal some data, run away with it. There's a lot of approvals involved. However, this is a unique data set from 80 countries around the world, grassroots directly from operating theaters, pretty much not from, now, you know, some numbers that get reported back to the hospital, who report it back to their county, who report it back to their nation, you know, national kind of statistical. No, 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 it's directly from the operating theater into my database. Lovely. Uh, but to manage that, to make sure that happens in a clean and validated way, way and a secure way, uh, shiny apps and dashboards and apps and dashboards <laughs> can really, really help uh, you uh, as run kind of smaller, uh, huge studies with small teams. And this um, and this is a huge app with um, kind of lots of different pages. They, uh, the app also does things. It can uh, assign leads from these. 3,000 people, uh, kind of give responsibility to people, give uh, share information between people uh, about teams and kind of what hospitals are registered. And that's less than a thousand lines of code. So again, you can, um, you can build these things relatively quickly. You don't need like 10 software developers working on it for two months. No, one will do, <laughs> one in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. So why do I keep mentioning lines of code? Um, some of you might, might have already shifted in the chat, 
like, oh, no, no, she, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Real programming isn't coded in long, lines of code. Of course it isn't. Um, the, there's an example here. So I'm going to load my two favorite <laughs> packages to tell you this. And the new Palmer penguins. Yes, the, the era of iris and cars is over. And we have <laughs> the penguins. I know this is a health data science talk, but I just can't resist doing some penguin data analysis for you. Okay, and here's a traditional uh, tidy pipeline. So we take the penguins data set, uh, we send it into a filter. Uh, we want, only want to filter for one island, Torresten Island. Uh, then we uh, send it on to uh, to drop NAs because we uh, we want to drop uh, all lines where sex is missing. Uh, then we want to do some um, group by or subgroup analysis based on sex. So we say group by sex, and then we send it to a uh, really cool thing slice max so we wanted to for each sex we want to know um uh the um we want to pull out the penguins with the longest flippers so slice max flipper length because we had done group by just beforehand it will uh, give us the longest uh, or the maximum for each of these uh sexes and then we use select to quickly um uh, select the three columns we want to present now that's a what is it? Six lines, seven, six lines of code, yeah? Well, I could do the exact same thing using a single line, obviously, just nesting them together. And these are the same tidyverse functions, so I'm not even going into kind of base R versus tidyverse. I'm just, uh, you could write the same uh, functions and it's, uh, it does the exact same thing. It returns the two penguins with the uh, uh, kind of longest flippers on their island. <laughs> um, but that's not super useful. So, okay, why do, why, do, why do I keep saying this is 300 lines of code? This is a thousand lines of code. Um, it's just to give you an indication that you can do this and very small teams can start using Shiny to make their lives better. Uh, they can use, start using Shiny to kind of automate some of the things or kind of help automate or help check uh, some of the things in them. Uh, so, um, so that's why I keep mentioning that this is so easy. <laughs> well, it's not easy, but it's not super easy, but it's not as hard as you might think. Uh, and I'll point out uh, so uh, two, cool, two cool functions as well that were in the code in the previous slide. So the uh, slice max is basically, uh, in the past, I used to do, if you look at the top there, penguins group by sex, filter, flipper length, double equals maximum filter length. No more, no more of that. You can now just use slice max or slice min, and it comes with extra options. So if you don't want, if you want more than just a maximum, if you want the three kind of longest flippers, you can do n equals three, and you can tell it how to handle ties. So if, if do you want to always return three, or if there are equal lengths, do you want to, you know, return all of them that are in the top three? Another thing that I used to do a lot is filter not is NA and then the variable name. So in this case, sex. Again, there's a much shorter way to do this. There's no need to keep doing not is NA to get rid of missing values before they come back and bite you. Uh, and they always, <laughs> always do. Uh, drop NA and the name of the variables that you want um, kind of filtered out, the missingness filtered out. Right, there's a little penguin tour. Now back to R and how it gets used uh, in clinical data. So that, uh, that's the hospital I work at. Again, you can see that's a pretty big hospital, has 900 uh, beds, uh, it's usually 90% full. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, 800 patients every day. There's a lot of data that gets uh, uh, kind of generated or kind of stored on these patients. And um, while obviously it's used for kind of clinical practice and terms kind of assessing the situation, it could also be used for research to make uh, kind of better decisions or faster decisions, so just more efficient decisions in the future. Um, but there's too much of it, too, too much for uh, just a few. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of data scientists working at that so hospital. And, not the only one, uh, but there's too much data. Like you cannot hire enough statisticians to analyze all of this. Furthermore, statisticians alone don't really know what they're supposed to be looking at, what could be useful, what's a good research question for this um, kind of uh, patient outcome or improvement. 
So there needs to be uh, increased uh, collaboration um, uh, or people, um, medical doctors, clinicians need to be able to work together with statisticians in, in, on a scale that's never happened before and more efficiently, more faster, they need to understand each other better. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to learn R. Again, I'm not saying that every doctor at every hospital should learn R, but the ones who are doing research, uh, especially more data-driven research than maybe kind of some other, uh, other kinds, uh, really should be capable of doing some of their own data analysis, some of their own reading in a couple of data sets, combined two data sets, just to have a quick look before they go knocking on the statistician's door and um, kind of ask them to do something that neither of them understands. The statistician doesn't understand what the clinical problem is and the clinician doesn't understand what the kind of statistical methodology is. No, they kind of need to meet uh, slightly halfway or so. Um, and, that's, um, uh, and that's where I'm coming from. Or that's where all of this health, R for health data science, uh, kind of training, uh, uh, training clinicians, training health researchers to use R is coming from. And uh, we've been doing pretty well with it. Uh, the uh, Surgical Informatics Research Group, uh, which is uh, where I'm based at, um, has a pretty active GitHub profile, or if you um, check out the github.com surgical informatics, there's also a link to our website and Twitter. So uh, the blog posts are probably better to read than just GitHub repositories. But um, you'll see there are 18 people there, and all but two are clinicians, so doctors working at the hospital. So there are two data scientists and 16 clinicians in that team, uh, GitHub team. Um, so clinicians can code, <laughs> they do code. Uh, we've been teaching R for health data science for four years now. We started uh, running this tiny course in a tiny um, kind of classroom off the side of the hospital. Uh, we're <laughs> begging people to come, very much like, hey, do you want to come? I'll teach you how to do R. And most people are like, no, 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 what? what? <laughs> So, uh, so we're like, no, it's really good. We're really good. We're not going to show you too many equations. There's going to be lots of plots. You get, you know, it's it's going to really colorful. It's really efficient. So we went from that four years ago to um, we just can't run the course uh, frequently enough. It gets sold out within days. Uh, people are constantly emailing me saying, "Where's the next course? I want a course." So we we decided to write the course up into a book as well. The book is freely available, so anyone can read it. You're welcome to buy it as well if you like to get a physical copy. But it is freely available for every uh, for everyone to use. Um, thanks to the book down uh, book down format. And really to kind of summarize on that, uh, I really like this uh, kind of uh, educational quote that you do not need to be a mechanic to drive a car. You just need a driver, driver's license. And that's, uh, that's how I think of clinicians who code. Uh, every, uh, to be able to do a little bit of our code, re reading a couple of spreadsheets and get some of the, some plots out, you do not need a, a degree in statistics or mathematics or computer science. Uh, you know, don't need like five years of experience of writing code before you can do. No, you can start driving the car or using R without having a full understanding of how it works. That's for uh, mechanics of form uh, or engineers even. Also, you don't need to be an engineer to be a mechanic. So it works in. Um, um, lots of different ways and it's huge help if uh, researchers or clinicians uh, are, are able to have a quick look at the data sets just kind of identify where there are loads of missing values because sometimes uh, a lot of times uh, students or kind of research students come to me and say hey I need your help okay here's my data where's the p-value p-value of what wow, which groups uh, these groups i'm like this group doesn't have a single observation it's all missing all of that data is missing and they didn't even know that so they booked the time with a statistician or they kind of managed to track me down uh, somewhere in the big hospital 
Uh, and the, the whole conversation ends at, uh, well, you don't even know that there are zero patients in that group, so I can't give you, a, no one's going to give you a p-value. Uh, so you need to look at your data, you need to know your data, you need to know, and this is a, a kind of a radical example of zero, but often you'll have half of the data is missing in one group and it's co complete in the other group, and really you need to figure out why there's so, such differences in the missingness before you can then start answering questions on the actual uh, kind of what happened and the outcomes. I also love this quote by Frank Harrell, uh, using data to guide the data analysis is almost as dangerous as not doing so. Uh, so Frank is, uh, is uh, talking to us later today on statistical misconceptions. I'm really looking forward to that talk. I'm really proud to be kind of presenting on the same day, even if it is virtual, as him. Um, um, and I think this is uh, this is where clinicians can really help to make sure that the data is looked at properly um, uh, before uh, a statistician who may or may not understand what's the best question to be asked or what's the most useful um, kind of way to uh, uh, analyze kind of different interventions or what what's actually possible to implement in clinical practice. So it really helps if people. Uh, researchers can uh, uh, get started with their own uh, kind of exploratory uh, analysis uh, and uh, yeah and that's it uh, for analysis now let's go back to cars and driving uh, i feel like we didn't talk enough about cars um, you do not need good brakes to go slow in fact, you want to have really good brakes so you can go really fast, right? Uh, if you think of the uh, the oldest driver in your village, <laughs> town, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the really old guy who drives super slowly, basically rolls out of his driveway and rolls back home, yeah. He probably doesn't even have brakes. He doesn't need brakes. His car just stops when it's next to his house. But if you want to drive fast, you need really good brakes. And in our terms, that means you need to write tests. So here's an example. Penguins again. Well, let's say you're working in a hospital, you're a data analyst, you're a data manager, you have some coding skills. Someone comes to you with a data set, says, hey, please, can you split this based on the uh, flipper length? I want one data set that has all the penguins whose uh, flippers are longer than uh, 190 millimeters, and the other data set should include all the penguins whose flippers are short, uh, or not uh, 190 or less than that. Yeah, okay, cool. So you write your two filters, data set one, it gives flipper length is less than 190, uh, flipper length uh, data set two is um, greater, greater than or equal, to, you, you, you're a careful person, you check the resulting uh, tables, you're like, uh-huh, okay, two, one, they add up to the original data set. You might even write this out on a, a line, you know, to add up, you know, you're like two plus one equals three. Good, I think it works. I haven't lost any data. Um, I'm gonna send this, I, uh, I'm gonna send this off. The two data sets are going off. Great, exactly. Um, a year goes by or whatever, they come back to you again. Hey, could you do the same split again? I have an updated data set. Uh, I know it won't take you long at all because you already did it a year ago. And everyone knows that R is this cool thing where you can reuse the code. You can you could always do uh, things super quickly. And you're like, boo, 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 but this is a new data set. I need to go slow. I need to read it in. I need to check it over. I need to uh, run my code again. I will have a quick look. And yeah, the new data set had four rows, but after your careful investigations, you discover that, oh no, the new splits uh, have two and one, so they don't add up to four, they, they don't add up, so something's gone missing. My filters that worked perfectly last year, perfect, good result, excellent, everyone's happy, no longer work. Um, 
and you discovered this because you were a careful person and you were able to go slow you uh, and obviously this is a very simple example usually you would have maybe uh, a few different steps and every time someone sends you a new data set you could just blindly rerun them or you really you should be going through each step to see if anything in the data set has changed so that the steps that were okay last year are no longer okay and then you discover yeah of course of course um um I want to handle missing values as well somehow. Um, I, I might want to drop them, but that wasn't the, the brief. That wasn't what I was asked to do. I was asked to split it in two, not splitting in two and drop some. <laughs> uh, so you decide to combine uh, the flipper length is less than 190 or is NA flipper length. So you're going to put the NAs into that, the first data set as well. Um, so yeah, how cool you're like, oh yeah, this is even better. But you know what I mean, next time you'll, uh, another thing happens, something that happens in the format. So really, you could have gone faster if you had a test written in. So uh, in the first year when you did your little split and you checked that everything works, you should have added one more line that says, stop if not, row data set one plus row data set two, double equals n row data set two. Uh, this would have returned true and just kind of walked by. And then in year two, instead of kind of reading in the data set and going through line by line, you can quickly run your script again and it will scream at you. And it will say, error, these don't line up. And you're like, oh, good, let's go and see what's there. Uh, some of you are thinking, oh, you're mad. You're inviting more errors on yourself as if R doesn't error enough for me. It does, it does. R errors are in my hands every single day. Don't worry about it. Uh, what's a couple of more? Uh, but yeah, this is an error I've written or you're, you've written stop it now. The stop it now is a very basic, simple R function, but there's a test ta that package that includes a lot more advanced, advanced ways to uh, write different tests so you can test that the output is a plot you know you can test that the, that the size of the output is uh, what you expected it to be what it was a year ago so by including these tests in your code so what i call them like breaks uh, you can go faster because then you can rerun your scripts a while later much faster to complete why r for health data science because there's so much data, we need to look at it. We need to work on it together. Um, people should feel empowered to uh, start using our on their own data sets. And um, I mean health uh, very widely. I mean, all biological sciences, um, hey, let's even call it geology. Yeah, geologists can use our, our, our health data. Um, everyone should, if they want to, uh, do uh, research or any kind of uh, personal improvements uh, uh, with data, then it is possible to learn R and to start doing really cool things in R. The community is strong and it's uh, thanks to the community as well as the kind of convenience of the tidyverse packages, it's absolutely possible for anyone to use, uh, learn R if, you, if they want to. I'm not saying everyone should, but if you need to uh, do data analysis, then learn R. And finally, to go fast, make sure you can break. Uh, thank you for listening. And hi, Mihal is back. At least I can see him in my window. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina, for talking to us for this great presentation. I just want to start with a, a very brief remark. We had a great message from the chat that I will allow uh, for myself to rephrase right now from PD want to remain anonymous, but PD mentions your course of data science in health data, of, 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 the, of data, of analysis of health data. She, she or he participated in this course at the University of Edinburgh. She thinks you are a great teacher and she really took, she was really proud of your talk. So PD, I hope that you are very happy with the talk. I'm all utterly impressed with what we know showed to us, what we know said. And yeah, let's go. Thank, thank you, PD, again for a shout out. And let's go to QA. Uh, so, Rino, would you mind stopping share screen? Because if you stop share screen, screen we will be both visible. So, it, 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 it will be for us to easier to pretend that this is a real conversation, let's say. So, first question 
do, did you need to fill a good, uh, good practice requirements to implement Shiny apps in clinical trials? Yes. The first, second, or the third Shiny app I wrote was not to run a clinical trial. It was to generate some plots. <laughs> you know, uh, so I mean, obviously, start slow, uh, walk before um, walk before you run, and stuff like that. Uh, and also, when I write the shiny app, um, what I usually do is I test the R code pretty really well. So the first couple of times, I almost babysit the app and I see exactly what it did, or not first couple of times, first tens of times. Uh, so uh, you need to be really careful with all, both the tests are written in as well as kind of sense checking that it works as expected. Sorry, sorry, thank you. And the next question from our audience, and I want to remember our audience that you can ask questions here on YouTube chat and also on our Slack on the Keynote Reno Pulse channel. We are very welcome in both places. But the, going back to the question, what's the biggest challenge when analyzing clinical trial data? Analyzing which data? A clinical trial data. Oh, uh, missingness, because what often happens is, um, it's called loss to follow up. And of, uh, what, what often happens is that patients who get better, uh, they don't bother going back to the hospital or they don't need to come back to the hospital. So often when you, you have a patient and you do something with them, you treat them, and then you never hear from them. And for the next five years, so then you have to assume, did they die or are they like living super happy? Are they living their best life? And then well, can I assume that, they're, you know, so it's getting the missing data and the missing information and to, uh, uh, to be able to say, uh, make robust uh, kind of um, conclusions. <laughs> I see, I see. And now we are going from the medical aspect where it's deeply technical one. So about tests. Do you, are you using, uh, what are you using to do, to do tests? Are you using asset from asset that maybe checkmate by Michel Lang or, or just regular stop if not for your tests? Uh, the, the test type package, but also you can, you can do a lot with just stop if not. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, just kind of being very diligent, asking lots of different people to test. But in terms of our code, uh, I get by with the test that package and stop if not. Uh, and you have to be really quite creative to write tests as well, because if you only, if you expect it to work, it's quite easy to find the test, write a text test that you will pass, but you actually, you almost have to want to break it. Or it, it really helps if you get other people to write tests for you. And um, because you're kind of, you want your <laughs> scripts to work well. <laughs> So just to, just to, just a quick follow up. You mentioned that you are you are working in a large uh, large team. So you are so so you are helping other people with their tests, or do you working on this collaborat co collaboratively? Would you mind uh, expanding on that? Uh, yes, everyone in our team uh, writes R, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, we all kind of help each other or kind of. Uh, uh, ask each other to have a look. Uh, we do uh, code reviews a bit. Uh, we should do more <laughs> uh, where we uh, we can help uh, kind of debug each of this code, but also help identify things that could go wrong and stuff like that. So yeah, we, uh, but I don't sit down and help test for other people's code. I don't have time for that. I need to write my own code. Because <laughs> uh, I think, I don't think that many, because in software development, obviously tester is a whole separate job. You know, there's a tester and there's someone who writes tests for software developers. I don't, I certainly don't know of data science teams who could afford a tester. <laughs> but I think it's amazing that you are supported by such a large team. And we have a very personal, so very general question again, a bit, uh, a bit personal because, and also subjective, but in your opinion, what tools or books uh, are the best for a statistician to become a health data scientist. So we have someone with a strong mathematical background, a statistician, and he mm -hmm. wants to do a health data science. What mm -hmm. he or she should do? Our book is a good start, but our book is written for beginners. So if they already do R, 
uh, that might not be like kind of uh, thick it up for them. Uh, in which case, Frank Harrell's modeling book. I mean, that's the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the famous RMSC book, yes? Yeah. I see, I see. That's definitely. Let's let's say that's a very important book in our <laughs> lives. I guess at least that's my that's my impression. Uh, Rido, uh, and 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 a side note, I really love that you mentioned Frank Harrell during your presentation. You have, you, you provided us with 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 with, with quote of him, but he he did a lot of his own. Uh, he has a lot of. Uh, Mm, a lot, a, a lot of good, uh, good advices on uh, how to conduct data science, and I think one of the advices which is the most applicable in the health data science analysis is uh, he, he he's calling I think this I think dichotomization when you are, when you are categorizing uh, continuous variables, and I and at least from my opinions, uh, from my experience of working with clinicians, this is quite uh, this is very quite uh, quite common in this case. For example. They just ask, oh, I don't, I'm not interested if patient is living for X, uh, X days after the operation. I want to mm -hmm. know if he's living for a week or longer. Yeah. And how, how are you educating uh, clinicians in this aspect? Uh, I've let them educate me. There's a good reason why they, <laughs> because <laughs> they cut variables into uh, categories. Because if you're going through a hospital, uh, and you see, you know, tens or hundreds of patients, you cannot do a full machine learning model for every single one that puts the curve through a kind of uh, nice little uh, lot, um, kind of curve. You need to be able to say greater, less than or greater than this value, less than or greater than this value, less than. And nurses need to be able to do that. So nurses look at these charts and say, this is greater than or equal to, this is greater than, oh, and the third one is also greater than, oh, call the doctor. You know, it's, it's just, it's not going to work any other way. So if you want to do um, any kind of modeling that is applicable in clinical practice and then doesn't get in people's ways in doing their actual kind of, kind of medical work, then you have to be pragmatic about it. And so I've let them educate me on that. As much as I love uh, kind of continuous variables, I've given up. <laughs> But 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 if if you see that they are wrong, that they have some physical misconceptions, how are you explaining this to them? Because sometimes you know, sometimes they are used to things that not, that are not necessarily right. Sometimes they are doing things that are slightly wrong, and it's good to educate them. How you communicate this? Uh, that, for example, we should change something. Well, in terms of uh, developing things that need to apply in clinical practice, they're not wrong because they know what will work and what is not usable. Uh, however, obviously there are. Oh, huge misconceptions around what are p-values, how p-values work, how to interpret the results of a trial and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I, do my I do my best. I teach, uh, I teach statistics as well, not just uh, uh, and I try to kind of educate people um, on some of the main misconceptions of p-values and stuff like that and maybe kind of the uh, analysis you're right also wrong analysis types of, like wrong regression models get used for the wrong data uh, all kinds of happenings happen uh, but at the same time i think not letting clinicians or health data scientists do their own analysis is more dangerous because then the divide between what's useful for patients and what statisticians understand is greater. So I think we all need to kind of let, uh, you know, let, let kind of some uh, meet in the middle and kind of do and educate each other and work together really, not just one is here, one is here. And the statistician develops a model that just can't be used in hospital because they don't have the time, they don't have the technology, uh, they don't have the uh, kind of staff right? Um, and equally, the clinician shouldn't be developing the models that are wrong. <laughs> uh, that's actually amazing how you are emphasizing communications, because I think this is the aspect of the, of the, of the data analysis, which is, often, which is often neglected and very wrongly. So, so because we need to switch to panel soonish, a very last question. Is machine learning and deep learning showing their utility uh, for clinical data? Yes, yeah, it is being used, um, uh, and it's yeah. 
<laughs> Short answer is yes. Okay, that was that was a quick one. So let's try let's try the next one. So the, the documentation for software development, especially in the in the in the clinical environment, could be quite painful. Do you have any advices for that? Bookdown really helps uh, because uh, you can use Bookdown to document your project. So, like I said, internal cookbooks are often. Uh, uh, work as documentation as well. So the R Markdown, Bookdown, Blogdown, uh, they're all kind of related, they're all kind of the same family, has really, really helped uh, Roxygen as well uh, to make uh, documentation much easier to use. But uh, uh, but the, in the end of the day, you have to put in eff extra effort to write documentation. Documentation does not write itself, it's not born as a side product except if you use Roxygen maybe. <laughs> uh, so it, you need to put a lot of effort in. And actually, again, coming back to, uh, I mentioned previously that software companies have people who are testers, right? Who just write tests. Software companies also have people who are documentation writers or technical writers. So they have whole people, like all whole departments who write documentation. And again, I don't know of data science teams who have hired a document, a technical writer. <laughs> Dear Reno, it's so great to talk with you. Uh, I know that we would love to prolong this Q&A, but unfortunately we can't. And to our dear audience, please switch to our panel of bioinformatics because that's where Reno will be uh, in the during next during during next hour talking with us and other invited guests about how to do efficiently bioinformatics and R. And for your keynote, thank you very much, Reno. That was great talk. Amazing energy, I really felt it. Thank you very much. And I hope that, uh, that, that we will meet on next YR conferences. Bye-bye.